One verse from Srimad Bhagavatam. It is the essence of all the Bhagavatam's instructions. Therefore, he instructed me this verse again and again. Purport. This verse from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 11, Chapter 2, Text 40, was spoken by Sri Narad Muni to Vasudev to teach him about Bhagavad Dharma. Vasudev had already achieved the result of Bhagavad Dharma because Lord Krishna appeared in his house as his son. Yet in order to teach others he decided to hear from Sri Narad Muni to be enlightened in the process of Bhagavad Dharma. This is the humbleness of a great devotee. So uh, we will read the sloka that um, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was given to by his spiritual master soon because there was no purple to that sloka, so it makes sense to read it. But um, first of all, I would like to uh, sort of recap this story because this story at the moment um, the story of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu going to Varanasi and um, speaking the last 20 verses in the assembly of all the Mayavadi sannyasis he's like in the middle because um, he's about to change tack where he's talking about the glories of chanting and so um, that is finished. So um, where, where we at is that Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu early in his sannyas, he went to Varanasi in India, right? And Varanasi is known for its impersonalism. In fact, there's traces of impersonalism and uh, monism going back many, many thousands of years when um, Govardhan Hill, Sri Govardhan didn't really want to go there when Augusta Muni was carrying him and went past Vrindavan he said I'd rather stay here so he organised um, a way by which he could stay in Govardhan Sri um, in Vrindavan Sri Krishna's pastimes. So anyway Varanasi had some great devotees of uh, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu there at Tapana Misra and Chandra Shekhar and they were, they were getting besieged by the Mayavadi sannyasis who were criticizing Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. How come he's a sannyasi? He's in the Bharat line and Bharata line, case of a Bharata Sampradaya. He should be studying with Danta Sutra. And what's he doing? Why is he going around chatting like a man? So, uh, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu visited these two great devotees uh, and he was staying in the house of Tapana Misra when uh, another Brahmana devotee came to the house and he said, look, I've invited all these sannyasis to my place and I would really sincerely uh, invite you to come even though you don't like you never associate with these sannyasis still this particular point in time um, I'll invite you to come there and it was the will of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu that he wanted to um, meet with these Mayavadi sannyasis so when the um, time came it, we all heard the story that he went to this house of the Brahmana and it was a full house packed full of Ekadandas, full of sannyasis of the Mayavadi class, are all sitting there and they've all been talking about Sri Chaitanya Mababu, how he was disregarding their sampradaya, disregarding their line, he was out of order. So all this criticism was going on. So you can imagine the air being thick with criticism. So, so when Lord Chaitanya Mababu came there, it was quite um, unconstitutional that he somehow rather was uh, the only seat available was uh, where he washed his feet and when you wash your feet it's a little bit wet there, moochy and that was the only spot available for him to sit so he sat there 
Um, no one came and said, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, come and take a, a nice seat in uh, the assembly because when we have advanced Vaishnavas come, we like to offer them a good seat in an assembly. I have a little story just to break the ice about one uh, devotee, great devotee, God brother Rausa Mogadas, that he was just telling us this story that one time in the early days in 72, he was in Bombay and that was before any temple had been built and they were all living um, very austerely and there was a communal um, I might as well say shack that they've put together just a make two house had the deities in it and it could fit only a small number of devotees in it and so Prabhupada was coming so he was he came and he was giving a darshan so the shack just started to fill up and fill up and the moga he got in there first so he's right at the front sitting right at Prabhupada's feet and um, it began to fill up and it was all swelled out and then Srila Prabhupada came and he was sitting there nice and comfortable and there was a lot of jostling for position and then Tamal Krishna he came last right so he comes inside and Prabhupada looked at Tamal and then he looked at Amoga and he goes like that so Amoga had to give up his spot for Tamal Krishna Maharaj so it was etiquette, you know, Tamal Krishna was seen to devotee. So Lord Chaitanya he sat in this spot and then uh, he began to emanate his effulgence because he was the supreme personality of God and he was so effulgent that it's described. It was like millions of suns. So you can imagine that this sort of um, rays coming from Lord Chaitanya just blitzing the whole um, assembly. And of course they noticed this, so uh, immediately Prakasananda Saraswati, who was the head of the um, uh, Mayavadi Sannyasis, he came, he took him by the hand and led him to a very nice seat, um, like the speaker's seat. So um, then he very nicely welcomed him at that point in time. and. <laughs> the conversation began because actually Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he was the centre of the conversation, that's what it was all about. So he asked him sincerely, why? Why, why, why all this chanting and dancing, all this emotion? Mayavadi sannyasis don't show any emotion. You're supposed to negate all the emotions as a material. Thing. No material under the modes by showing emotion should be studying Vedanta and you shouldn't be associating with these other people who are frothing at the mouth, dancing and chanting. You should be associating with us and Yassis talking about all um, the different uh, Vedanta sutras that there is, studying Sarurak Basya. So, why are you not doing this? So, in the next 20 slokas, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu describes why he isn't doing this, that he simply uh, cannot do this under the instructions of his spiritual master, case of Abharati. He said, you're too much of a fool to study the Svetanta Sutra. This is Lord Chaitanya's words. So we can take it from this, that if you're too much of a fool to study, what to speak of everybody else, because Lord Chaitanya, as everybody knows, was a first and foremost scholar in Sanskrit grammar and all the Shastras and he knew everything uh, before he became a devotee uh, when, well he was always, before he took to uh, Bhakti Yoga under the auspices of his spiritual master Keshava Bharati. So, um, so conclusion that everybody was a fool there if Lord Chaitanya was saying that he was said that my spiritual master, he told me that actually that's not the process in this age of Kali. So he gave him the first verse. So this, we're just about to read the second verse. So the first verse that he gave him was Harinama, 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 Evakebalam, Kalona Stevana, Stevana, Steva Gati Ranyata. That um, in this age of Kali, the only way to achieve 
complete self-realization is through the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And Sri Chaitanya Prabhu, he said, I, I confess that when I started chanting this Maha Mantra, I became slightly bewildered. Uh, that all the material energy, that all this knowledge accumulate become all clouded and I started to develop ecstatic symptoms uh, with my body and I started dancing and chanting uh, like a madman wanting to chant the holy names of Krishna more and more and more. This taste just kept growing. So he submitted this to his spiritual master. He said, what is going on? Uh, why, uh, what kind of mantra is this? Right? And so the spiritual master answered that um, it is the nature of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra that anyone who chants it immediately develops love of Godhead. So um, his spiritual master became very pleased with the fact that he was uh, exhibiting all these symptoms and he taught him this other verse which I'll chant right now. This is text 94. So, um, so this is the verse Lord Chaitanya was talking about. Um, when a person is actually advanced and takes pleasure in chanting the holy name of the Lord who is very dear to him he is agitated and loudly chants the holy name he also laughs, cries, becomes agitated and chants just like a madman not caring for outsiders so this is a quote from the Sri Bhagavatam 11th Canto 2nd chapter verse 40 and as Srila Prabhupada says in the purple, it's quoted by Narad Muni to Vasudev to um, bring out the love of Godhead, that question which uh, Vasudev so nicely asked. But before that, this shloka, this shloka, shloka was also quoted by the nine Yogendras to Maharaj Nimi. Now Maharaj Nimi was in the line of Manu, so we are going back so many kalpas, millions of years, it's uncountable. So this proves that this process of bhakti yoga has been here eternally. So Maharaj Nimi asked for instructions from the nine Yogendras who were um, sons of um, Rishabdev. Right? So, Strangely enough, they received instruction from Narad Muni at that point in time. So he instructed them. And so they quoted that shloka to Maharaj Nimi, who uh, in turn, Narad quoted to Vasudev, Lord Chaitanya is quoting this shloka now in Chaitanya Charitam Rita. So Narad Muni, he's a, um, a wonderful, ecstatic, um, bhakti influencer in this history of the material universe and sometimes uh, uh, we wonder maybe wh where is he now when we need him sort of thing <laughs> that um, more, more so than ever this um, material world needs instruction. Srila Prabhupada did state that um, he cited Narad Muni he'd come maybe one occasion or several occasions said oh Narad Muni was here, so um, you know. So Narad Muni is still present. He is conscious of the fact that our society is still going. So um, so then um, Prakashananda Saraswati then said, "Well, certainly um, only one." Uh, who is favoured by good courts by um, good fortune indeed obtains the love of God it this was the answer after Chaitanya Mahaprabhu quoted that sloka. So one who is favoured by good fortune, this is Prakashananda Saraswati's words. So 
In our words, uh, there is a sloka Prabhanda Pramite called Bhagavan Jeev Guru Krishna Prasadi by Bhakti Latavija that uh, good fortune comes when one comes into association with a guru, a spiritual master who can actually give the love of Krishna and by this association then one is so fortunate that he can finish up his cycle of birth and deaths in this material universe just wandering up and down Brahmanda, Brahmati, Kona Bhagavad Brahmanda, this universe, Brahmati, you're up the top and then throw slowly through so many births you're down the bottom and then you're up here again and it's eternal and so um, so um, then um, Prakashananda Saraswati said well look there is no objection to you being a devotee of Lord Krishna that, that is okay but why are you avoiding uh, this discussion in our assembly of Vedanta Sutra, what is going on there? Right, so um, then in the next 50 slokas here, we're right in the middle, we're just about to start on that. Lord Chaitanya starts talking about the Vedanta Sutra, you know, why he doesn't discuss it with the Mayabhadu Sanyasi. So just very, very briefly similar. Uh, summarize it just to give you a bit of a taste of what's going to go on the next 50 slokas. So, um, Chitetan Mahaprabhu said that the Vedanta Sutra is a spotless Puran that was written by literal incarnation of Krishna, Srila Vya, Vyasadev, and it is perfect. Uh, everything that he said is perfect, but unfortunately, there was a commentary that you were studying. Um, written by uh, Sankaracharya, it's called the Sarirak Bhasya and that is actually um, there to cloud your understanding. He said it's not Sankaracharya's fault because he was actually asked to do this. He's the incarnation Lord Shiva and he was asked to write this cloud interpretation. Now why would that be? Um, because Actually, at that point in time when he wrote it, uh, the Buddhists were very prominent and they were given the philosophy by Lord Buddha, who was also another incarnation of Krishna. So it goes back that uh, at that point in time when Buddha came, there was so much animal sacrifice under the injunctions of the Vedas that that sort of totally gone off the rails and sort of said animal sacrifices is the way to go and they were just using it to as an excuse for sense gratification to eat meat. So Lord Buddha introduced the himsa, non-violence. So that went on and to do that he said don't look at the Vedas, don't do that, just meditate on yourself within and then you'll achieve the highest goal which is nirvana. And nirvana is just a uh, absolute annihilation of the self and then you won't have any pain you'll be enjoying like anything be pain free so that was Buddhism and then so Sankaracharya was asked to come and reinstate the Vedas so Sankaracharya had to actually give more or less the same result through the Vedas because the step to theism, to belief in the Supreme Personality of God in, was way too big at that point in time. And that is understandable. The, there is so much difficulty in introducing the concept of the Supreme Personality of God in, just like in, in the modern age today, we see that people of sort of, uh, uh, what called it, Maya Parati Jnana, see that people's knowledge has been stolen by illusion and that's to do with science and so many other different things that oh god uh, god is not needed anymore we are so clever now why why this primitive culture of worshiping god that is very very prominent now we have to fight this and even um sometimes when people are attracted to the chanting of Hare Krishna mantra, that's very nice. The chanting is beautiful, it works. But the step towards theism, the fact that uh, Krishna is God, that's what you're chanting about. God, please engage me in devotional service, a very difficult one. Uh, I'm just looking on social media, I just want to bring this up. This is quite 
relevant to what I'm talking about is that uh, one uh, person who was in the village posted something on social media. It was very beautiful. It sort of went to, it was a poem and went in the sort of vein of, I want to surrender to God. I don't trust myself. I want to completely surrender to God's will. He can do for me what I need to do. So it went on like that. It was pretty brave for a person to put it out there on social media, as you know. So I thought, okay, what are the comments, you know? So it was a mixed set of comments, and then you get the usual comments. <laughs> okay. One was, okay, but what if there is no God? Uh, you, 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 you're wasting your time because um, you're just putting all your energy into a fairy tale, right? So that was one comment. So, you know, you get that comment, I don't believe in God. Well, okay, you believe. <laughs> okay, I believe in God, you believe there is no God, you still believe. So, why is your belief greater than my belief? You know, are you going to end up in a better place because you don't believe in God? So, we all have to believe in something, <laughs> you know. And then there was another comment I really love is like, I wonder where planes, computers, TVs, light bulbs, electricity, cars, etc that make our lives easier. Where do they evolve from? So I would say like, hey, man made all this stuff, so why are, you, why are you saying God is here? And it's the same philosophy Prabhupada used that example of the Russians, like during the Second World War, when the Russian um, religions were very, very strong. People in Russia actually have a strong faith in God. So communism, denied God, so they're going around, all the Russians are hungry, so they turn up with van loads of bread and say, look, here's some bread for all you are, all you people. Did God give you bread? No! We're giving you bread. So this is where it's coming from. Just a simple philosophy tried to dupe the people like that. So this is going on. Of course, in Russia, when that stopped, when communism broke down, religion once again thrived. It didn't kill it. It just suppressed it, but it didn't kill it. So we have so many thousands of devotees in Russia now. It's just uh, last count was 30,000 devotees. They're everywhere. <laughs> except in Australia, it's too far to go. But, so it's very, um, they're very pious religious countries. So um, it's the same thing here that like people have been duped. They're thinking that we've got all these products here. So that step to understand um, that actually God, he is the intelligence in man. He's the one that created all this. First of all, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita in the 10th chapter that I am the intelligence of man. So we use Lord's creation to create things. So that's just an example of Krishna's intelligence, right? And not only that, um, it's talking about, Shri Krishna, uh, Krishna explains the seventh chapter that there is, um, there is two energies. There's uh, first the inferior energy, which is all the material elements like earth, air, fire, water, ether, and that develops into our bodies, bone, mucus, stuff that you can see. And there's also the material energy, that's also earth, air, fire, water. So you dig a hole, you get some clay, and you sort of start shaping the clay how you like, and go, oh, here's a cup, you can hold water in it. Oh, what if I bake it? And then I'll be able to have a pot, right? That's intelligence. So if you extrapolate that, you use your intelligence to make uh, things. So intelligence is a material element that God gives you. So it all depends how you use it. So that's the subtle, uh, that's the uh, superior intelligence, but it's still not the eternal intelligence, just the, the subtle and the gross. So this is subtle intelligence, the mind, um, the intelligence, the ego is what our subtle body is. And that intelligence goes with us from one lifetime to another with our subtle body, mind, intelligence, ego. So when we pass away, the soul um, travels in that subtle body to the next body, depending on how well we've developed our intelligence, which depends a lot on the mind. So this is where the Hare Krishna Ma mantra comes in. That is, the mantra means controlling the mind. So when you chant the Hare Krishna Madhuri, you develop these ecstatic symptoms of love of Godhead. And so it works whether you believe in Krishna or not. The mantra works in all cases. 
So Srila Prabhupada um, said, um, chant and be happy. So this is our process that we, first of all, when he came introduced to chanting Hare Krishna and take prasadam and feasting. So he introduced beautiful prasadam and um, people took to it because it's a natural instinct of the soul. The soul is thirsty for spiritual happiness. So, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he um, so he saying that these Mayavadis, um, you know, that Sari Rakbasya has um, clouded the meaning of the Vedas. So anyone he described, anyone who studies the Sari Bhasya is actually condemned to uh, just illusion. So that's the illusory nature of Mayavadism. Mayavadism gives not this, not that. Um, so they're searching for the absolute truth and then they've come to the conclusion um, that the absolute truth is actually a manifestation of the mode of goodness because there is no truth because it's all maya so maya comes from the three modes of material nature so the modes of material nature come along and the only thing that is actually real is brahman so therefore something comes from brahman manifests itself so therefore uh, and goes back to brahman so therefore they're denying not this not that nothing, nothing is real and um, therefore the Lord isn't real either, nothing is real, we're just uh, this manifestation and the, the perfect, uh, perfect result is uh, merge with the Brahman, it's all one, the, all one philosophy. Guru Das gave a very nice example of that when he was here three years ago, he said he was in Rishikesh, it was a uh, festival, Prabhupada was there it was freezing, <laughs> really cold as in January. And this Mayavadi was at him, you know, why are you believing in Krishna? You know, it's all one, you know, you can believe in everybody, it's all one. So Guru Dad said, well, look, if it's all one, give me a blanket. Give me a blanket. If you really believe it's all one, then you've got to give me a blanket and you sort of don't worry about it because it's all illusion, right? So he said, yeah, right, I'll give you my blanket, right? So Guru Das put the blanket on, he went to sleep, he was nice and warm. In the meantime, the other guy was freezing, you know. <laughs> he sort of wakes Guru Das up later on, uh, Prabhuji, Prabhuji, uh, can I have my blanket back? Only if you understand that Krishna's different from oneness. Okay, I accept Krishna. <laughs> he gave me his blanket back. <laughs> so, um, so what they don't understand that actually <clears throat> Vyas um, that the absolute truth is um, uh, so Lord, Lord Chaitanya describes the absolute truth first of all the conclusion of Vedanta Sutta is uh, one relationship with God to develop our the study of Vedanta Sutra is one to develop our relationship with God second to uh, develop activities in uh, devotion in relationship to the Lord and the third one's ultimate goal is to develop bhakti so that comes under the uh, auspices of Sambandha, Abhidaya and Prayojana and the goal is atol brahma jignasa search out the absolute truth so what is it? so Vyasadeva defines the absolute truth as the supreme person full of all spiritual opulences to whom no one is equal to or greater than of which we are just a spiritual spark so um, Supreme Lord he is manifest he is the supreme person who creates all this and he's untouched by the three modes of material nature because he's the creator of them he's not influenced by them this is the illusion of the Mayavadis but we, because we're the marginal living entities, then we are subject to the illusion of the material modes. And so therefore, consequently, we forget um, 
Then we've forgotten our position as a, a sparks, a spirit, spiritual sparks of the Lord. We are the same. We have that spiritual spark in tiny quantities. But because we've come to this material world, we have put ourselves in a situation where we can't actually relish the chanting of the holy name of Krishna. So we're trying very much and we actually get a taste. So Nanda Maharaj gives the purport and he describes that uh, it was said, uh, I think it was Sridhar Swami, that he says that bhakti teaches as a perfectional stage of life when we're, where one is endowed with the love of Godhead. So by the practice of bhakti, we redevelop this love of Godhead. And he gives a quote of Srila Prabhupada, once quoted uh, an example, he said that his students, he calls us his students, the students in India, they're exhibiting manifestations of ecstasy and going out and chanting the holy names, chanting Harinam, and all the Indians amazed. How come they're jumping up and down in ecstasy? What is it? How are they doing it? Because they're ex exhibiting the ecstatic symptoms. So similarly, by congregational chanting, we also see that there are sometimes that we exhibit so much ecstasy here, just when we have a lot of devotees here, or just it's been really intimate in the last few months, and we're so we're having some very nice kirtans in here, and I see there's no one that's miserable in a kirtan. Everybody's smiling and want to dance naturally. So there are there. These are there. And I know if you really want to go further than that, come with us to Surface Paradise on a Friday night and let's see if you can exhibit some ecstatic symptoms there. It's so ecstatic that we really take no prisoners, you know, just full on hurry on. So all the devotees being in surface, they know that. And we'll get, when we go on the surface next, you know, get the nectar, right? Love it. So that's the symptoms of ecstasy as opposed to Prabhupada gives the warning, the sahaja, you know, that the, uh, the show, the show of ecstasy, that is also there without the bhava. So the sahaja stage is the one who are materially motivated by showing the symptoms of ecstasy. So it's described that the material motivation is dharma, arta, karma and moksha. So sometimes you may exhibit the symptoms that you're very religious, you know, so like you're there, eyes shut, you know, I'm very pious, I'm very religious. There was one guy once that came here, never seen him before, had dreadlocks, looked like, you know, so do, and he prostrated himself in front, in front of that door there, right, so nobody could get in and out, so we could all notice him, you know, we couldn't get in the temple where they're walking over the top of him. Actually, he was thinking that he's very noticeable by his uh, austerities, but actually Krishna didn't notice him. Krishna only notices the bhakti. He doesn't notice these external shows. So there was dharma, there was artha, economic development. Or if I look that I'm pious, people feed me, give me donations. It happens so much. Oh, Sadhu can go around and make so much money. Karma, that I'll track the opposite sex. That is always there. Or moksha. This is uh, my liberation. It's a sort of shortcut that if I look saintly and everything else, but it's just like, uh, what do you say, a wolf in sheep's clothing. You put a, <coughs> I mean, uh, a wolf in king's clothing, a jackal in king's clothing is a story of a jackal in the jungle there that he pretended he was the lion once, right? And everybody sort of say, oh, he's the lion king. Okay, they're following him. And then all these other jackals started howling. You ever heard jackals howling? Go to Mayapur. They're unreal, aren't they? The human voice. They sound like humans. You know? So as soon as all the jackals start howling, every other jackal's got to howl as well. So all the jackals start howling, he starts howling. Wait a minute, he's not a king, he's just a jackal. Get him out. So that's um, Sahaja. So, um, so this, uh, had, you know, this is just a drop in the ocean of bhava. So how do you apply bhava? Because you apply bhava with unalloyed, you just focus on the chanting of the mantra. Uh, there's a Sanskrit uh, saying called lokabaya, that the devotees are not concerned with ridicule, praise, respect or criticism. 
with ordinary people um, views, ordinary people's views on the bodily concept of life because the bodily concept is there um, in this material world and it's influenced by the three modes and it's set up by our own philosophy that people have got their own philosophy they don't believe in God then they set up their own thing and they try to live in their perfect world with all their airplanes and all their um, gadgets and it's just like um, a make-believe dream that you can live in this perfect world because you're living in the material world and there's so many things that can go wrong um, Adi Atmik, Adi Baltic, Adi Devik, so much. Your mind played tricks on you. Don't get on with other people. They'll sort of, if you go too far and you're too happy, someone will bring you down. That's just the nature of the energy of this material world. And then what I speak of Adi Devik, this is caused by um, the demigods, like the demigod of disease, for instance, which we're all going through. That suffering. So um, the Mayavadis are in a similar situation where they're trying to um, get out of this illusion that this life is but a dream. But um, they can't get out of the illusion unless you perform bhakti and Krishna will take you out of the illusion. Jamma kama chavya chema divyam evam yovedi tatvata. If you know the science of uh, Krishna's appearance and past this material world, then easily you can remove yourself from this material world. Otherwise it's Brahmanda Brahmata, Kona Bhagavad Jiva, just circling around and around and around, lifetime of chasing the dreams. And in this world you sort of live the dream, but it's a really sad ending. You see it so many times that when you get old, no one cares about you. It's just like, doesn't matter how much wealth you got or how famous you are, you quite likely end up in an old people's home somewhere in a room and then you die in a hospital bed all by yourself really because no, all the people in the material world this day they worship youth they don't worship old age they don't worship wisdom there's not much credit given to wisdom in this day and age and one good reason is because there probably is no wisdom that they can give you they can't tell you what is the truth so um, so denying the Supreme Personality of Godhead, it, this was condemned by Lord Chaitanya in the sort of uh, in the next locus of the um, Chaitanya Chamrita, and um, so putting everything aside, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said that it doesn't matter what you know, your spiritual master says you're a fool. Therefore, forget what you know and take up and relish the chanting of the Maha Mantra. That is the purport. I'd just like to conclude, I think, in one of the purports in the Srimad Bhagavatam, there's a really nice um, shloka by um, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Maharaj. I'll just um, say the first line in Sanskrit, because Paribhada tu jano yatatatava, and it goes on. But it translates into, let the garrulous populace say whatever they like, we shall pay them no regard, thoroughly maddened by the ecstasy of the intoxicating beverage of love for Krishna. We shall enjoy life running about, rolling on the ground and dancing in ecstasy. This is from the Pajavali 73. Jai. Are there any um, comments or questions, corrections, assertions? Aspirations, anything? There's just an interesting point made about the voice, how they, they told uh, achieve nirvana and annihilation, and then they'll really enjoy it. So there's a contradictory statement if you think of that. Because you're just going to enjoy it if you've been annihilated. It's a, it's, a, it's a relative thing, you know, some, uh, <laughs> one famous um, musician in this world who purports himself to be a philosopher once stated, he said, I just can't wait to leave this body so then I get nothingness because this body is just so much pain in the mind and the body and everything that when I die there will be nothing 
I'll just be completely at peace, you know. So that's his relative concept of happiness, you know, that you annihilate the situation that you're in, you know, for nihilism. There's other philosophers, they started the, the philosophy of nihilism because nothing works, you know, they come to modern conclusion, not Mayavadi conclusion, there was this French school of thought in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, there's one guy called Jean-Paul Sartre who said actually this whole world is false, there is no reason to it, there's no reason for living. And then you will see in the records that he drove his car off the cliff and committed suicide. There's no reason to live, right? That's, that's the ignorance, you know. So that, that, that concept of happiness through nihilism is just a mode of ignorance. It's just ignorance, actually, because they don't understand the etern eternality of the soul, that the soul, you can't annihilate the soul. Can't. Bhagavad Gita says you can't cut it, you can't cut it with a sword, burn it with fire, wither it away. It's just indestructible and it will always be there. And what is the soul? It is an individual. So the whole concept of nihilism and merging and um, <coughs> absolving, um, it doesn't work. It's not like you put sugar in water and then sugar merges with water. It's more like a, you put a, a, an object, in a, a green object in a tree like a parrot and you sort of see that there's all green but the parrot's walking away in the tree there and you can't see the parrot. So that's the spirit soul, he's vibrating, it just goes there for a period of time. But it's described to be the last snare of Maya, he's still in Maya, he's still in that illusion. So he has to come back, he didn't get out. He didn't achieve transcendental status. That's, uh, <clears throat> yeah. All good. Jai, all glories, Shila Prabhupada, Ki, Jai.